Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. I'm Kelly Baisley, School and Family Programs Manager. Today I'm joined by Sarah Ranke, Master Docent, and Kathy Seguin, Touring Docent. Each Friday at 12 p.m., docents lead virtual interactive conversations about a few artworks in our collection or special exhibitions. The goal is simple, slow down, discover the joy of looking at art, and talk about the experience with others. For today's program, Sarah and Kathy will lead us in an interactive conversation about three artworks in our collection. We'll spend about 15 minutes or so with each artwork, and they will allow us time to look at each artwork on our own, slowly, before leading a conversation about each one with questions. As participants, we encourage you to engage in dialogue with Sarah, Kathy, and myself, and each other throughout the hour. A little housekeeping. Your uh, microphones are muted by default right now. And some tips for the session. We suggest choosing a quiet room and closing the door and silence any alerts from any uh, nearby devices. Try not to sit in front of a strong light source. Use headphones and microphones for best sound quality and a tablet, laptop, or desktop com computer for the largest and best picture quality. Make sure your screen name includes your first name and last name or last initial. To ask questions or make comments throughout the session, you can do one of a few things. You can unmute your microphone and jump right in. You can type into the chat box or you can raise your hand in the participant sidebar and uh, the moderator will call on you. We are recording today, so if you prefer not to be recorded, make sure to keep your video and your audio muted and use the chat box for any questions or comments. Do we have any questions at this time? All right, Sarah, what will we be talking about today? You have to unmute yourself. <laughs> Sorry, we all, we all forget. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Good to see y'all. Uh, today, uh, Kathy and I have chosen three artworks in three different mediums that uh, focus on change. And um, I'm sure that they will ignite different emotions and reactions. So we're kind of happy to get into the discussions. Um, we often, we have started sharing these events in order to um, give our uh, audience, our guests, a little bit more variety when we're um, talking about the different artworks. And today, Kathy Sequin is with me, and um, we had some fun choosing the artworks and planning the presentation, so we're both very, very happy to be here. We're going to discuss each artwork for about 15 minutes. And as it has happened in the past, um, our conversations can get lively and uh, we sometimes have to cut them off. And while we hate to cut off any conversation, we do want to give time to each artwork. So um, it's kind of exciting that we have to do that, <laughs> but I hope you understand if that's the event that occurs. Uh, also, as, Ke as Kelly mentioned, Feel free to use the chat box. Uh, Kathy and I are going to keep an eye on it for one another uh, as we um, talk about the artwork. But also, please feel free to um, raise your hand or ask the question uh, verbally because it helps uh, create a more conversational feel, and that is really what we're after. Uh, all right, Kathy, let's begin with a beautiful painting. All right, so we'll go to our first artwork. And as Sarah said, um, we know that people spend about seven seconds in a museum um, on their slow walk through the galleries. Um, and we're going to have the luxury of spending more time. And we're going to start by just looking in silence at this artwork for a few moments. Um, look at it all over and really, um, Take in the experience of it. OK. 
Okay. So what's going on in this artwork? This is Mary, and uh, I will uh, say that I think the birds are taking off. It looks like they've been roosting, uh, feeding, and they're all just uh, picking up and taking off. That's what they look like to me. Uh, this, the scene reminds me of uh, outside of Asheville, because I've seen, oh, I'm, I'm using my arrow like the rest of you can see my arrow. I, could, um, I see what looks like the, uh, a, a town. Um, yeah, there, exactly. And that All I've, right. I've seen. So you're seeing the birds, which are in the middle on the top. Those, those, uh, those that flock of birds that may have just taken off. Um, and you're seeing a village or a town. And in what area are you seeing that? As an area of the painting. The top, the right, the bottom. Yeah, exactly there. Mm -hmm. See the little hand going around? Whoever's oh, okay. Okay, Whoever's right there. Is, <laughs> yeah. The top right. Yeah. Okay. Good. And yeah. I, I'm also attracted by this uh, uh, bright red spots uh, lower left. The bright red spots on the lower left. So, and oh, what do you, what about those attract uh, you? I, they're 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 bright. Um, they're not large. Um, it's like sunlight is hitting, um, you know, the last of the autumn color because the trees are pretty bare. Mm -hmm. So the sunlight is hitting those leaves is what you believe. Um, and they're mostly bare, but there are still a few hanging on, so to speak. Okay. Yeah, some kind of weed. Mm -hmm. A weed. Okay, good. What more can we find? Barbara, you want to unmute? Um, I see several houses in the distance. There's a house with a red roof right underneath the birds. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm not sure, but I see on another hillside what might be, there's a tree to the, uh, on my right of the, and then it looks like there might be some more buildings on that hillside. Yeah. Okay. So, or it could be, you know, it could be a cemetery. I don't know. I mean, they, maybe it's small, but it's, it's, um, to me, I don't think there's sunlight involved. To me, this is a very overcast day. It, it almost makes me feel like maybe this is, uh, Asheville, like in three weeks from now and, or four weeks from now and all the leaves come down. Uh, it's very overcast. I see the, the clouds are very gray. It's so gray. you see this as, um, as, as the autumn season, um, and but a little bit farther along than we are uh, this yeah. week. Yeah. And uh, there are some signs of population here, although it's sparse, but uh, there's a city off in the distance, and uh, both you and Mary suggest that it could be someplace around here. Yes, it feels like that. Uh huh. Good. Anyone else? Now, what do you think about this? Uh, my name is Kathy. Oh, excuse me. Go ahead, Kathy. Oh, uh, thank you. Um, my yeah. picture just disappeared. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, what I was seeing the picture. Uh, Kathy, you're muted again. There you go. There we go. Uh, it keeps going back and forth between muting. If you're having difficulty with your audio, you might put a question or a comment in the chat and we'll keep an eye on that so that you can um, be a part of the, the dialogue. Um, so what what was the first okay, thing that thank you Oh. Um, okay, what was the first thing that you um, your eye went to when you looked at this artwork? Mary again. I would, because the birds were the first thing I'd mention, I kind of want to say that, but in fact, it's that gorgeous golden field, that great big bright golden field. And 
you know, um, Barbara, you're absolutely right. It's very overcast, but I still, I still see flashes of sun coming down and that, so that's, that's what my eye goes to that great field. And then that, then it lifts up to those birds. So, so what impact does color have um, on your feelings about this artwork? For myself, I'm very um, attracted to it. It, feel, it feels, I mean, I mean, that gold is a very warm color. Mm -hmm. Red is a very bright color. Um, and I guess it takes away from that leaden sky and those dark hills in the distance. I, um, it's, it's, uh, that's it. Yeah, okay. So um, it's that golden yellow. And I must say that um, part of the selection process was um, with this artwork. Um, it was that gold that was such an attractor. Yes, it's, um, it's such a, a beautiful, brilliant color, as you say. Well, the artist's use of complementary colors, of a complementary palette, really uh -huh. makes it pop and brings the gold, which is an advancing color anyway, really brings it forward. But then the use of the, the very soft green hillside mm -hmm. to the right, right, is an interesting contrast because if you, as I look at this, my eye is captured first by the gold and then is brought across by the horizontal line. There, there are a lot of horizontals here. Mm -hmm. And uh, then up to and the next level. So I love the way that the artist is working our eye through this painting. So Billy is mentioning um, a lot of uh, beautiful features in this, which are um, the lines, um, the undulating uh, lines, as well as the the fact that the artists use complementary colors. Um, Billy, would you describe a couple of those complements then? We see the gold, so where would be the complement in this? Well, the complements are really the first, the purple, if you if you look at the Prang color system, uh, the, the purple beneath, but then also that dark blue sky, or that bar dark blue hills, I mean, above. So the gold is caught in between those two bluish elements. The warm and the cold. Okay. Right? Good. Yeah, and um, what kind of a story could we, um, could we build around this, um, this hillside, these fields? Um, and related to that, where, if you could go into this artwork, um, would you take, where would you take a walk? Would you sit somewhere? Would you just stand and look? Oh, I'd definitely take a walk and I would want to go over that gold hill first to see what's on the other side. Okay. You, you, you just keep getting drawn to that gold hill and you want to walk right over there. The other side and then maybe get up on the green hill. And get on the green hill. And anything else we can find here? Well, there's an interesting copse of trees or shrubs between. I'm, 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 I'm with you, Billy. I'm walking over the gold hill, and now I'm going to take <laughs> a right. And there's that kind of copse before you get hit the uh, the pale green. And it is an interesting story because I associate a, such a golden field with a um, a field ready for harvest. And I don't know how the pale, pale, pale green field fits with that idea of harvest. It's a late harvest. Or, uh, oh, uh -huh. uh, Sarah, what were you going to say? Just a second. So I was thinking that maybe, and I don't really know uh, my crops all that well, <laughs> but um, oftentimes uh, in autumn when one field is ready for harvest, the other field is just beginning its winter growth. Right, right. So Good, winter, right. That is just starting would, would be green. So our theme is uh, seasons of change and 
um, you all have touched on uh, so many elements of that here, from the crop rotation that farmers do to nourish their fields and um, not only produce winter harvests, but also prepare them um, for very fertile soil for the spring. Um, and uh, the birds that are possibly feeding in those fields and preparing themselves for um, the coming winter. Uh, and uh, and uh, Mary noticed the, the red um, as well and the hedgerows that are there. And Megan, um, Megan is going to have a picnic on the Gold Hill, <laughs> which I love. Um, so the artist, let's go to the label and we'll learn a little bit about this artist. It's Tore Asplund. And he was born in Sweden, but he didn't spend much time there. Um, his uh, parents came to the United States when he was one year old. And uh, Tori's um, favorite medium was watercolor, which is what this is, watercolor on paper. Um, and he, um, he loved muted, uh, muted colors um, and playing with color a lot in his watercolors. He did a lot of landscapes and portraits. He was also um, at um, a somewhat older age, at the age of 41, um, he was a combat artist. And uh, he was there on Normandy Beach uh, at D-Day. Um, and there is a beautiful, if you have an interest, you can Google his name and you will find um, a phenomenal painting, Battleship in High Seas. And it's an oil painting that he did when he was a combat artist. And um, there's quite a bit of history of the role that Battleship uh, played um, on D-Day um, and how they beached up to the sand and such. And Torre was right there um, as a combat artist. But then he moved into New York City and went to the um, Art Students League. And then he really started honing in on his art um, uh, using watercolors. Uh, the, um, the seasons on the farm, yes, Sarah mentioned uh, winter wheat, and barley, hay, alfalfa, clover, and that bright yellow may very well be, I can't confirm it, but um, I like to think that it's canola um, or rapeseed. It's a fairly easy um, crop. It doesn't require heavy, large equipment to plant. And if any of you have been uh, ever at the uh, Biltmore Estate and driven through, you'll see a bright yellow, beautiful field. Of, and, and I've been confirmed that that is canola that's planted. And just a little side note, a uh, little trivia. Um, does anyone know what canola stands for? No. You do, Mary? Yeah, it's rapeseed. It's rapeseed. And it is um, one of Canada's largest um, crop and it's short for Canada Oil Low Acid. So you can show that off now to everybody who mentions canola. <laughs> it's, it's a very uh, big crop for, for Canada. And um, at that, um, we'll move back to Sarah. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Kathy. That was mm -hmm. a great start. Beautiful, beautiful watercolor painting. Um, so let's take an active view of this artwork. Try to find the nuances and hopefully whoever has mentions a nuance, it'll be different for everybody. <clears throat> So when you um, first look at this artwork, what, what comes to mind? What do you think is happening? Boxing. Boxing. He looks, uh, he, he looks formidable. He looks uh, strong. Um, what else? To me, he looks uh, pensive and saddened. 
I don't, I don't see, he could be a boxer, but he, he doesn't necessarily, but he, to me, his, his expression is um, sad. So what makes you, can, what, can you tell me a little bit more about that, Barbara? Well, I think the expression around his eyes, there's almost, uh, the shading is lovely. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, the black and white, how, how expressive, but it almost seems like there might be tears brimming at the, uh, out of his eyes. Um, I, my impression was that he was very pensive and some kind of loss. Some kind but of he lost his, if, if he is a fighter, but maybe it's not related to fighting at all. Yeah, so, but his eyes look pensive. They look slow. Well, it looks like they might, might be crying. I might be tearing up. I mean, does, does anybody else see that or am I, I, his eyes, you know, the rim around his eyes look like they might be welling up with tears. I, I see your point, Barbara. I yeah. see that. Um, how are others affected by his eyes? I think he looks sad. Sad? Right. Sad. Getting some yeah. consensus. Or anything think, else? I think determined. I think he looks determined. kind of a determination or a real pensive quality about that. Yes. Determined, thoughtful, pensive. Um, these are all great, great qualities. So as we, as we um, view the artwork, where's the emphasis? Where were your eyes first drawn? Mine, it might be a technique or it might be a feature. Yeah, mine were drawn to uh, the, my eyes were drawn <laughs> to uh, the, 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 ver the very whitish spots. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's strikingly white uh, in the middle. Around the mouth and, and forehead, a little bit in the hair. And the, the white under the uh, left, well, as we see it, the left eye, mm -hmm. if you look at it, it that white is heart shaped. It is. <laughs> right under his eye. Can you, Kelly, can you um, put the, the, the pointer just to outline the shape of the heart? It's under, yes, there you go. Actually, if, when she uses her little wand there again, I think the other eye shares a similar it, shape, uh, yeah. it, which yeah. I did not notice before. Yeah, I would say I love I love that pointer, Kelly. Thank you so much. It is good. Um, so the it, it sounds like some of us feel the emphasis is is kind of in the head. It might be the eyes. It might be um, the shading that first draws your uh, attention. And so, what would change if the emphasis was somewhere else? Like, let's say uh, there was light tone in the lower right corner. Is, is, is where the lightness um, lays, does that really um, complement the picture, bring something forward, or would it change dramatically if the shading were someplace else? It draws my eye into two places, and that is not just the light, but then to his eyes. Okay. Good. I'm, well, very, I'm very much drawn to, I, and the second thing, after all that, that being kind of um, taken aback by the whiteness on the face, um, I go to the lips, mm -hmm. which, which, yeah, I just, I, and I'm not sure... Yeah, I'm just not sure of the, the, how the lips and the face um, work together. together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, um, I was very much drawn. One of the reasons why I chose this artwork is I was very, very drawn to the tones in his face. And, and, the, and uh, for me, the emotions that those tones um, uh, brought to, to, my, to, to my impression. Um, and it, I just think that it's, it's a, such an interesting print. So let's talk about contrast a little bit. Um, so where, how do you think that the contrast impacts this artwork? 
Well, I think that the, the dark colors, they look like blood. It, it looks like he's got a bloody nose and maybe blood like a uppercut above his eye and even maybe blood kind of dripping down his lips and his chin. Yes. It was, mm -hmm. No, I see. I, I see exactly where you're talking, and and the 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 bit over his, if I'm looking at it, his left eye, that kind of is coming down right here. Um, I think that 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 also uh, I can understand why you might think that that uh, is is blood, which kind of uh, reinforces is this gentleman a boxer? And I was wondering if the white. On his face, if boxers, if they put chalk on their hands before, you know, inserting their hands into the boxing gloves. So I was wondering if maybe he took off his gloves and wiped his face and then that is chalk. Kind of, I'm wondering what the that white. Could be. That, I, I, that could very well be. Um, I think that the contrast and the shading around his face give us a whole array of, of emotions that we've kind of mentioned. Um, and Sarah, there's um, uh, one uh, question uh, that Barbara Preston is asking, and she, um, could it be clown makeup? She's uh, wondering about that. And it, uh, it looks white like clown makeup. Um, do you think that it is, uh, applied on his face? Uh, I, to me, I was thinking when I looked at it, the line on his lip, the one that Megan said might be blood, the way that it's so uh, perfectly formed on the top lip and then on the bottom and the way it's shaped and the fact that it does look like hearts um, <laughs> made me think something that maybe it was intentional, that it wasn't just the shadows that was forming the whiteness and the, because the white, is, he, he definitely looks like a dark skinned person. So the white seemed, it does stand out. And to me, I thought maybe um, it was clown makeup. Maybe it was makeup of some sort. I don't know. And the chalk sounds like an idea too. Just yeah, no, I love this conversation. This is bringing up all sorts of interesting aspects. And um, I, I think that that makes our conversation really rich. I appreciate that. It, uh, it might be some kind of cream or a medicinal thing. You know, when, when you, yes. I know men, when they cut themselves shaving, they have that oh, like white stuff they put up on there. I don't, there's a name for it. I can't recall, but so it, medicinal. <laughs> Does it look, does the shading, do the lighter parts, is it, what does it look like? Is it shiny? Is it, is it matte? Do, do you, what would it feel like, do you think, if you, if you were to touch that, that shiny um, part? I, I think it would be a, a stinging feeling is my, my guess. But what I'm also struck by is how a little, and those are just small little strokes of the brush are able to be so powerful in bringing out an emotional response mm -hmm. and the size. So, so let's 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 uh, dive into that emotional response. Um, what what emotions when you when you look at this artwork? Uh, what emotion springs up first? And I get several. I mean, if I look at it for ten seconds, I get there's five emotions. But um, when you first look at it, what's the emotion that raises in you? Does he look happy? Uh, Sarah, there's yeah. um, a few comments that are come somewhat related to that. Um, Micah, uh, Micah Jean um, suggests that it's, it, has the power of uh, black and white photography, the contrast, so, um, so there's power. And Kathy um, mentioned the swollen lips, um, which is um, an empathetic, I would say, um, factor. 
So, uh, and we had, we had uh, mentioned early on that he looked determined. Um, does he look carefree? No, he, I would say, go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. No, I would say the opposite. You know, I, I think that uh, your question, what's your first emotion? Uh, his, and I am drawn to his eyes. It's the eyes that capture me and they look, they look sad, they look reflective, but I don't know what he's reflecting on. Is he reflecting, and I do, do see him as a boxer, That's, I see a boxing glove there at the bottom. So is he reflecting on a loss? Mm -hmm. Or is he reflecting on even maybe a victory and now he's wondering, well, what's next for me? Or is that brief, I, I don't like boxing, but I've seen enough boxing movies. <laughs> Right. To know there's a lot of different emotions that go on in the boxing world. So I, I sort of see both that, gee, maybe he lost or maybe he won. And he's wondering what's ahead. It is. So, uh, Sarah, uh, can I add something? This is Mary. Yeah. Um, it was a real challenge. I mean, you, the, 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 your question is, what emotion did it bring up for you, me? I'm looking at it. Yes. What do I feel? And I was finally able to... Uh, figure out. I um, I care about this person. I I, I feel care, caring toward him. I want to know that he is all right. That's because I don't know, and he and he seems he doesn't seem all right. And I'd like to, uh, you know. So I'm going to, I'm going to add one more, I'm going to kind of guide us here because there's some in, interesting information about this artist that I do want to be able to share and I don't want to run out of time, but I want you uh, to think about does, um, when you look at this artwork, do you think of uh, what change we spoke about? Did he win? Did he lose? He's pensive. When you look at this, do you do you think of something changing? And it's okay to say no. <laughs> well, you know, the one true thing that you can always count on is everything always changes. That's true. So whatever it is, whether he lost a fight or he won a fight or he's sad about something, Whatever is going to happen next is going to be a change. It is. I appreciate yeah. that, Barbara. I think he, he might even be thinking, it's not what he thought it was going to be. It's not what it's cracked up to be, so to speak. So to tag with, I think it was Sarah said, if he was winning, maybe it's not as good a, good a deal as he thought it would be. Right. Right. Yeah, be careful what you ask for. Um, uh, Kelly... Well, we can go, and I know I'm cutting this short. I could go on forever, but I, I don't. We want to do all three pieces. So Kelly, if you could switch it to the label slide, please. So this is about a boxer, the champ. Uh, the artist is Doc's Thrash. And um, the print, it's a print. It's an aqua tint on paper, not real big. Um, and Doc's Thrax, Thrash was, he was a very interesting guy. I enjoyed uh, doing a little bit of research. This is um, Joe Lewis. And of course, Joe Lewis is a famous boxer uh, in the 30s and 40s during World War II. And um, he became uh, an American hero that kind of crossed the color line. And he was probably one of the first American heroes, uh, African American heroes, that actually did cross the color line. His fights, <laughs> I loved this, and this is how it was described. His fights became politicized. Like, oh, hey, there's a, there's a novel idea for 2020. Um, and when he fought um, uh, the Italian heavyweight champion, Primo, Canero in 1935, his audience as well as yellow journalism and mass media all kind of pumped it up to democracy versus fascism. 
and, and he was fighting against Mussolini. And uh, he, he won knockout and it gave him uh, his nickname, which was called the Brown Bomber and all related to politics and war. He, uh, his fame continued and, in, and, and alongside of his uh, in the ring fame, he, uh, pro because he was African-American in the 30s and 40s, he had to be so careful about his character. Um, and he, he was, and he was very, very successful. And he became a role model, again, across the color line, which is pretty unusual. And then in 1938, um, Mr. Lewis had a rematch with uh, Max Schlemling, and that too was politicized uh, as Nazism against democracy. And he knocked um, Max to the ground within the first uh, two minutes, I think, of, of the um, boxing. And um, the boxer's name is Joe Lewis. Anyway, the champ is an aquatint. It's a print. It's made from um, uh, creating an image with tools and acid on a metal plate. And then um, the, the uh, scrappings from the etching stay on the plate. It is submersed in an acid uh, bath to, to create the image. The lightness and the darkness are created because the particles, those etchings, are, um, if they're super dense in an area, it will make it lighter. And it also uh, matters as far as how long it's in the acid bath and how strong the bath is. So Doc Thrash was a um, acclaimed painter, draftsman, printer. He did dry point, aquatint, mezzotint, um, uh, lithography, linoleum cut. And he used to combine these processes um, because he just wanted to make unique impressions. And so he kind of had that explorer inventor attitude. And in 1937, he invented a new print process called um, carborundum mezzotint. And there he used a copper plate and he used crystals, um, carborundum, which are silicone carbide, and they're rough, rough crystals. And he would scour them into the metal plate and with a flat iron. And um, it created all of these really dense, smooth sculptural forms, velvety textures, which served him super well because he, um, he depicted truthful and sensitive um, artwork of African Americans and did all kinds of uh, landscapes and nude series and, and different genre series. And he could create these great textures just like he did in the Champ with this aquatint. In his own process, that, that carborundum mesotint, he called them Ophelia-graphs in honor of his mother, whose name was Ophelia, which I think is very cool. All of his, all of his artwork in a time when, when African Americans were shown as big brutes or in, or black-faced whites and, and really kind of, uh, um, um, d d d d I can't remember the word, degrading. Um, uh, uh, pictures and, and they, the African Americans were not respected in how they were portrayed in art. He changed all that. And he, um, his artwork showed uh, noble and, and, and beautiful depictions of um, African American and black life. He lived in Philadelphia in a very um, arts area called Charswell. And there were like um, Duke Ellington and uh, John Coltrane would often play in the clubs around his house. And in, um, after World War II, it kind of became an activist area and Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Cecil B. DeMore uh, would also be in Charswell. That was the name. After the riots in, 60, in 1964, um, 
The neighborhood was characterized as uh, dangerous, violence prone. That rhetoric was reinforced by the media and by the Philadelphia police. At the same time, government subsidies encouraged the white flight and um, racist lending practices did not permit the African Americans to buy. And so the whole area kind of went down the drain. But there is a uh, hope just like they, they saved Nina Simone's house, Doc Thrash's house uh, in 2020 is um, being supported by organizations so that they can save his house too because they wanna, they wanna tear it down. So um, I will turn it back to you. Sarah, I had a quick question. Oh, and I went over. So, I, I just, just a quick question. It's so small. I'm wondering if it's part of a larger work or why would it be so small? It, as far as I know, it is not part of a series. And um, I think the little plate that he uses are very, very small. But I'm going to go because Kathy's going to beat me with a stick. <laughs> <laughs> not at all, Sarah. This is a great dialogue. Um, it's a powerful um, artwork. And... Um, really uh it touches on so much of our theme uh in in other areas um seasons have changed so let's go to our third um artwork kelly a little change of pace here so let's take a few moments and just uh, uh take this artwork in Okay, so what's going on in this? Is this a figure? Is this a piece of sculpture or, or is it a, I'm thinking this glass. Is sculpture. Is, it's glass. Um, it's glass. Blown yes. glass, blown glass. Mm -hmm. I see, um, infinity figures mm -hmm. and where do you see that uh right in the middle right the, in the middle. big infinity remark mark um kelly can you put your oh yep. okay yep. all and, right and it looks like green stamps to the lower right s and h yes yes <laughs> uh, i don't know if everyone will understand that but dating <laughs> yourself Kelly won't <laughs> oh chromosomes carol says chromosomes chromosomes so we're seeing a lot of patterns in here yeah and what more shawl or lace collar i'm not the white the white that looks like it's 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 crocheted or you know needle or needle point or something. So you're seeing um, that larger white area as being almost like a fabric texture, it looks like or textile. woven or knitted. It looks like a textile or lace. I think Megan may have mentioned lace. Yeah. Okay. Good. What more? So Carol um, is saying that um, uh, she's reminded of like a caterpillar or a chrysalis or a dragonfly. Uh, and that that caterpillar or chrysalis would be on the on the top left there. I see the fly. Is that is that the is that all in that area where you're seeing it? Okay, Carol, is that, that's the area. Is that right? Okay. And we're all, oh, stages of life. That right. these are this, all this stages is, of life. Yeah. So what now I'm thinking the textile might be a baby blanket after reading that comment in the chat box. <laughs> uh-huh. Uh-huh. So a baby blanket. So we're seeing a lot of life here. And, um, the infinity symbol, chromosomes, um, stages of life, a baby blanket. Flowers, <laughs> of course. Flowers. flowers. 
Of course. Of course. Okay. And I don't want to lose the comment from the chat um, that it, it's r reminiscent of those um, hard candies that would come out at Christmas. <laughs> oh, Mary, thank you so much. That's what Sally said. Yes. Yeah. Um, that's a great colorful hard candy. Well, and look, and look at, so there's that central flower, that kind of daisy-like flower, mm -hmm. and right to the left of it is truly a piece of that hard candy. <laughs> <laughs> so we have a lot of different textures here as well. Now, what do you think, um, we, we've gotten a, a touch of what the story of this apple might be, but um, I would like everyone to envision an orchard full of these. And I would love to hear what those trees look like, what the branches look like, perhaps, and if there are sounds. Well, notice that one of the leaves is green, but one of them also is white. Mm -hmm. One is green and one is white, yes. We so, don't usually see white leaves. Yes, Billy, so maybe it's a, it's a fantastic um, apple. It's a fantasy apple. What do you think the the if you if you could uh, and chose to cut it open, what would the pulp look like? Ooh, good question. Lots of the same. Lots of color. Lots of variety. Lots of variation. Certainly not yeah, yeah. just uh, what you expect when you cut an apple in half is a white apple. Uh huh. That's a wonderful uh, vision. So you you would cut it open, and it's not white like an apple. It's got those beautiful uh, myriad colors and textures and shapes going on inside too. Kathy, do you have any other? Um... Uh, pictures of this apple? I mean, we, we're only seeing from one angle. <laughs> well, shall I? I'll share you. Uh, I'll share something. <laughs> this apple um, uh, sent me on a bit of a wild apple hunt. Uh, Sarah and I both wanted to see the other side, just uh, as you were bringing up, and we we just you know fell in love with it and wanted to see what was going on over there because you could kind of see that there's patterns. So um, I went to the museum and there, there is a Richard, Richard Ritter is the artist and um, you can imagine what the title is. <laughs> Anyone want to take a guess? Thinking about Eve, a bite of oh, the oh, Eve. Oh, Eve. I love Anyone it. Anyone else? Before I tell you, before I spill the beans. No, but I do like Carol. I do like Carol's. It's like, well, of course Eve ate it. Look at yes, it. Yes, of course. Well, it's called Apple and Richard Ritter. Maybe we'll go to the um, the label, Kelly. Richard Ritter was the artist, and um, he uh, he fell in love with doing apples and pears, and so he's done a number of apples, and um, quite a number. I don't have the count in my head, but um, dozens for sure. And uh, the museum has um, his, uh, a different apple sculpture um, on display. This particular one is not, but it had some of the, the ones that on, is on display had some of these similar features. And it was fascinating. I kept looking at it and thinking, is this the same apple? Because it was not clear right away. Um, so we don't have um, uh, a 3D view of this particular apple, but if you go to the museum, it's well worth looking on the third floor in the, um, uh, the landing area, and you will see a cabinet with three beautiful apples uh, by Richard Ritter. He is known around the world, and um, he was declared a national treasure in 2011. Um, a North Carolina national treasure. Uh, he is still with us um, at what I calculated the age of 80. I believe he has settled. Um, there's a lot of privacy issues, I think, so I couldn't find a lot about him currently, but um, not far from Penland. Um, and uh, uh, the artwork is titled Apple, <laughs> appropriately enough. It's glass with Marini's and Latticino. 
And he was an artist um, and recognized for his tendencies um, and talents um, when he, in elementary school. Um, and he started working with, um, he was encouraged to pursue a career in art in high school. And he started working with glass um, when he was doing pewter casting. He did 11, he was at the furnace 11 times when he knew that glass blowing was the media he'd been searching for for his entire life. And so that's what he did. And he has a retrospective online which um, includes one of his first pieces. You can still find it, it's 40 year retrospective. And his, one of his very first um, uh, artworks that he did was from a green wine bottle. And you can still find the cork in it as well. Um, <laughs> And uh, so that's kind of fun to see, but he developed these proprietary um, processes and techniques. And he is quoted as saying something that he remembers from um, Penland, which was the, is the School of Crafts that was founded in Bakersville in 1929. Um, and he was a resident artist there from 72 to 76, which as some of you may know, it allows you to get intensely in and focus on your artwork, and he just loved that. Uh, but he developed Marini and Latticino. So Marini are the canes with colors that when they're uh, sliced uh, horizontally, they become these beautiful images like the flowers. And he makes his own Marinis, all these color canes that he puts together. And uh, Latticino is the baby's blanket. Yeah. Latticino is um, a type of an opaque white Venetian glass. Um, and uh, so he pioneers many of these techniques. And this is the quote that I love from Penland. It was at Penland that he met, I met Bill Brown, he said, a man of tremendous vision and enthusiasm for the art, um, particularly the American craft movement. And 20 years later, his message, that of the necessity to be honest with one's work and to pass on our knowledge of that material lives with me. And so he does share his technique. And that's in, in direct contrast with this, the beginnings of glass art and glass vessel making, which is 2,000 years old. Um, those people who invented it, those craftsmen, kept it secret. It was it was a closely held secret how to make it. And uh, so that contrast is wonderful. Um, just to conclude, the infinity symbol, um, I'm so glad that, it, that that was noticed because uh, just bringing it back to seasons of change, the infinity symbol holds deep meaning of spirituality, love, beauty, and power. And I think in a world filled with distraction and complications, it represents hopefully a sense of simplicity and balance. Um, the dragonflies also um, are very whimsical and um, people generally don't like flying insects, but they love dragonflies. <laughs> um, and my, my closing thought before moving over to Sarah is um, that I'd like to suggest this is Slow Art Friday and thank you all for participating. Um, I like to think of it as slow thinking time as well. And perhaps a time where we can set aside preconceptions, maybe some biases we didn't know we had, assumptions, and just enjoy discovering new insights. Um, in this way, we're embracing the ever-changing new seasons um, in our lives together. Sarah? Thank you, Kathy. What a joy. Mm -hmm. It makes you want to go do some apple picking in Hendersonville, right? <laughs> be, we'll be able to do that quite soon. Well, um, Kathy and I had a, selfishly, Kathy and I had a ball. <laughs> so we hope that you did too. We, I think that doing slow art, at least for me, and I think I can say for Kathy, it's, it's just such a special time. And um, it does make us feel connected to others who, who love our museum and, and love the art that's in our museum. So thank you for joining us today. I think that the conversation, uh, the comments were insightful and uh, we they sparked meaningful conversation. 
So I think that that's always a joy, the way to kick off our weekend. So we're glad you joined us. Uh, until the next time, be sure to visit the Art Museum website to keep abreast of all of our engaging and, and fabulous programming, virtual and in person. And um, come on down. Come into the museum, see, see our collection, see the uh, exhibitions. Uh, the, the store is great and the cafe is fabulous. So we've got a lot of room to let you see beauty and uh, social distancing. So come on down. Okay. Thank you to Sarah and Kathy for leading our discussion today. Thank you all for participating and being here. We love having you. We invite you to register for next week's conversation, which is going to be led by touring docent Megan Pyle. And the theme is, could your child make this? <laughs> Everybody have a great rest of your day and a good weekend. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.